Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with Fishery. Of course, this is the four-part segment that comes out every week for all of our channel members. It's only $1.99 to support the channel this way, and you get four extra episodes. Every month I like to leave one of these episodes public, but the rest can always be found uh, on the Aquatic Morning Show. So if you're watching on the Aquatic Morning Show, Welcome, and thank you so much for watching here. If you're a member, thank you so much for supporting the channel as well. Now, as always, you don't need to be looking at the screen for this episode. Uh, you're not missing anything but my, uh, well, I guess new look. I, I in, a, in a crazy fit of uh, uh, spontaneity, I just grabbed some scissors and cut all my hair off. So, uh, that's what's up with that. <laughs> Moving on. So we are already at episode 114 of Fishery, so thank you for letting this happen. As always, thank you so much for supporting me being able to do this. So, today I have an interesting story for you, but before we get to that, I just want to say uh, this month and uh, all summer really, I'm not probably going to do more than one story a week about dried up lake beds or rivers because there are so many articles about this drought and lack of water in the Southwest and in the Midwest, uh, in even, even in the far West and in the Southeast. Um, it's happening all over really. Um, but some places being hit much harder, quicker. So with that being said, the Rio Grande is completely dry right now uh, in Albuquerque in places. Uh, there's still pools of water left there, and there are a number of endangered species, and there are teams working tirelessly right now trying to get things like the Gila trout out of there, and uh, just different desert pupfish are even being threatened in some of the little holes and slot canyons they live in in the southwest. Um, so it's a little scary right now what's going on um, that being said I, I'm not covering that story today I'm gonna be covering a exciting story coming out of Hong Kong so uh, the the title of today's episode is creating superior grade carbon nanotubes using fish waste so thanks to their low toxicity chemical stability and remarkable electrical and optical properties, carbon-based nanomaterials are finding more and more applications across electronics, energy conservation, uh, and storage like batteries, catalysts, and uh, biomedicine. Carbon nano um, uh, onions are certainly no exception either. Uh, so first reported in uh, 19... 80 CNOs are nanostructure composed of concentric shells of uh, fullerness uh, resembling cages with within cages within cages. That's why they're called carbon nano onions. Now they offer multiple attractive qualities such as a hard surface area, a large electrical and thermal conductivities. Uh, unfortunately, they conventionally uh, are not the best for being made. They require uh, harsh synthesis and conditions to be made, such as high, high temperatures, vacuum conditions, and they dem demand a ton of energy. So some techniques can circumvent these limitations, but instead call for complex catalysts, expensive carbon sources, or dangerous acids, and then really strong basic conditions, and they greatly have limited the potential of this being kind of a super material in, uh, in the scientific and engineering world. Fortunately, not all hope is lost. So in a recent study published by Green Chemistry, and it's available online, uh, published uh, on May 21st, 2022, and now it's available to the public uh, for free, a team of scientists uh, from the Nagoya Institute of Technology in Japan found a simple and convenient way to turn fish waste into extremely high quality CNOs. 
The team, which included uh, Professor Yun Zi Jin uh, and master student Kai Odachi, uh, as well as Hong Kong professors and uh, assistant development teens who worked on synthesis routes, they were able to figure out how to turn fish scales into uh, these these products and they use extracted fish waste is what they're calling it to convert it into CNOs now what they're using is just a few seconds in a microwave like a home microwave but a little bigger and through pyrolysis they're able to cook these scales down and convert them into carbon nano onions so it's really fascinating that nature has basically set up everything we need to make these things in the form of pretty much every fish's scale. So they're not the necessarily the bony or cartilaginous scales, they're the ones that are essentially evolved from teeth on fish um, and that go down the body. So things like uh, on a carp or on um, any of your, your, your larger like cyprinids and things like that. So the scales that you see floating in the water from time to time, um, in your tank if some little fish gets in a fight, happens a lot. And in the wild, they lose their scales when a fish dies or gets attacked. It happens frequently. And in fish farms, it happens a lot, as well as in the manufacturing of fish-based foods and products. So while the exact reason isn't even clear why this is happening, the team believes that it has to do with the collagen within the fish scales, which can absorb enough microwave radiation to produce a fast rise in temperature, which then leads to thermal decomposition or pyrolysis, which produces then uh, certain gases that actually support the assembled carbon nano onion structure. And what is remarkable about this approach is it needs no, uh, no chemicals or harsh acids or bases or anything like that uh, to start this, uh, this process as a catalyst, uh, nor does it need any harsh conditions or prolonged heat or wait times. The fish scales can be literally converted into these carbon nano onions in less than 10 seconds. Moreover, this synthesis process yields the carb carbon nano onions with very high crystallinity, uh, which is really remarkable. Um, you know, and if this all sounds like Greek to you, uh, it's because it's just cutting edge technology. It's very similar to fiber optics or carbon nanotubes. A lot of these, uh, they're calling them next generation building materials oftentimes. Um, you'll see them as NBMs for the acronym for that. But with these ones that are made just in a microwave with fish scales put in there, uh, they said that with very high crystallinity uh, is is how these are made, which the the molecules align and are held up by gases for a moment long enough to catalyze the carbon within those fish scales. And then the rest falls away, essentially, uh, when the gases dissipate or, or evaporates off. So the process use biomass waste as a starting material, which is great because additionally that went to landfills or just got dumped in the sea or stayed in the sea. But during synthesis, the surface of the CNOs are selectively and thoroughly functionalized with negative COOH and negative OH groups. If you're a chemist, I, I don't know what that means. This is in stark contrast to the surface of most CNOs, which are prepared by conventional methods and which are typically bare and have to be functionalized through additional steps. So this automatic functionalization has an important application in in the implication of these carbon nano onions. So when the carbon nano onion surface is not functionalized, the nano structures tend to stick together and owning to the attractive property known as PI PI stacking, this makes it really difficult to disperse them in solvents, which is necessary in any application uh, that they've tried in the past that's solution based or catalyst based. However, since the proposed synthesis uh, processes uh, produce functionalized uh, carbon nano onions, uh, it allows for an excellent 
uh, dispersibility in various solvents. So this can be made into bigger mats and things essentially. So yet another advantage associated with this is that the high crystallinity in this uh, way of doing it allows for some really interesting optical properties. And Dr. Uh, Shariaya explains that the carbon nano onions exhibit ultra bright visible light emissions with an efficiency uh, or quantum yield of 40 percent if you're a physicist please let me know what that really means uh, <laughs> the value which has never been achieved before and that is about 10 times higher than any human synthesis has ever created so to showcase some of their practical applications the carbon nano onions team demonstrated their uh, use in creating leds and blue light emitting thin films of leds essentially these micro leds and the carbon nano onions produced a highly stable emission of this specific light through that crystal the micro crystals um, in a diode form and when dispersed in various solvents, including water or ethanol or isopro uh, isopropanol, the stable optical properties enable them to fabricate large uh, emissive flexible films and solvents. So literally they can create water that glows, it, that, that has conductivity and that can then emit light and be, be vibrated in a chemical chain reaction and it will open up new avenues for developing next generation displays such as solid state lighting you have solid state uh hard drives now but now they're talking about solid straight optical prop solid state optical properties um it can help with fiber optics in the long run and furthermore the proposed synthesis technique is totally environmentally friendly for the most part. I mean, it uses a little bit of electricity with the microwave, but it provides a straightforward way to convert this fish waste into an infinitely more useful material for us humans uh, than just scales floating around in the water or being tossed into a landfill. So the team believes that their work could contribute to the fulfillment of several of the UN sustainable development goals, which are important for fighting global warming. And if these carbon nano onions make their way into next generation uh, OLED and QLED displays, they could greatly help reduce manufacturing costs by over 40 fold. So uh, again, uh, this is just a really cool thing in that they are fabricating these ultra bright carbon nano onions via a one step microwave process. So uh, this was in the, uh, the Journal of Green Chemistry. I thought it was super interesting and you can read more about it if you guys are into physics or into, uh, you know, uh, engineering and industrial or any, well, any sort of design or engineering, you might find it more interesting. And same with chemistry. I know that was kind of dense or wordy, but it's pretty exciting. The gist is they're turning fish scales into super useful nano products uh, that have some really unique properties at a, 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 a mere, you know, 40th of the price, like they said. So really cool news. And it involves our fishy friends helping us because apparently, you know, fish scales are reflective. And uh, the guanine little crystals that are in there, they need to form in a space, you know, they're in the iridophores that reflect light and cause fish scales to look silver. And when they do that, they, they need either a, a gel or a water type, or not water, but a liquid solution for the crystal to form. But it needs to be completely airtight and vacuum sealed within the cell. But then when that's in the microwave, that liquid gets agitated, poof, it's gone, and the, the, the cells in there realign into carbon. And they then form into rings because of the way that uh, scales are laid down. And that's why we can read fish scales like uh, the rings on a tree, and they can tell us how old they are. But this also works in a layering process for these carbon nano onions and carbon nanotubules also. Really cool stuff. So thanks for watching. I know this was a long one because I had a bit to say at the beginning, but I'll see you tomorrow and uh, I'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye. Hey guys, what's going on? Episode 115. All right. So today's episode is called What is a Datsu Koi? And how and when were they created? Well, 
Adatsu Koi uh, are Koi with no scales, or very few scales. Selective scales along the back or head, or maybe a tail, or maybe along the lateral line. It just depends on the, the type that they're trying to breed. So it is an old genetic trait yet relatively new in the koi world, considering there's over a thousand years of people domesticating uh, carp and what became koi. Uh, and the first Datsu koi was only developed around a hundred years ago. But new versions keep coming out stemming from that hybridization that occurred a hundred years ago and this scaleless characteristic that can be crossed with almost any variety of existing koi. So any color forms or patterns you see, they can cross it and either have these incredible chrome and silver scales in select places or no scales at all. Uh, so you get kind of a leathery catfish or suede look to your koi. And this uh, advent in hybridizing uh, and line breeding kois after that uh, is called, um, or is very similar to Jinrin, which is diamond scales, or beautiful shimmer rather than big old chunky scales. It's like leathery shark skin or something. Now, my under microscope, it's not like shark skin. But anyways, simply put, Datsu doubles the number of koi varieties that are possible. So for example, Kohaku and Datsu Kohaku, Sanku and Datsu Sanku, uh, as well as uh, Showa uh, and Hesii and Nishiki, <laughs> I always say that wrong, Nishiki, uh, Datsu, and so many more. So these are koi are a kind of Asian carp species that scientists only just recently discovered through genetic testing and genomic sequencing are a completely separate species that hybridized with the Central Asian carp or Chinese koi style variant, which is Saprinus carpio, and the Japanese koi, which historically are in fact descended from East Asian carp, not the Chinese carp, which are from Central Asian carp. So that that is known as uh, Saprinus rubro uh, fuchsius, and that is what we think of when we think of the Japanese koi. For a long time, we thought that the Japanese just got koi from the Chinese and then continued to lion breed them. Maybe they hybridized with one of the 19 wild varieties of koi at some point in the last thousand years. But apparently, out of the 19 species in the genus, they're saying that mostly Japanese koi are Cyprinus uh, rubofuchus and uh, the other ones are Saprinus carpio. Uh, now, that's new science that's come out, but let me tell you about some other stuff. So with goldfish, they're a different form of carp, and they're hailing from their wild ancestor, Saprinus auratus, uh, and they're also kind of a Central and East Asian uh, carp species. So all three of the common ornamental carp, uh, Carpio, Rubo, Fuchsius, and C. aratus, are food sources in many countries. However, the scaleless carp, or mirror carp, slash leather carp, of the Carpio uh, species were originally developed in Europe, not in Asia. They were developed in Germany for ease of preparation. If you've seen my recent video, I go into way more detail on this for 40 minutes and talk all about the history of it in Europe and America. But this first resulted in the creation of the mirror carp, which is a decorative carp in the sense that it has bright scales, uh, but it was really bred so that it didn't need to be scaled to be eaten, and yet would still have a pretty display when served to royalty in Europe. And so various monasteries around Europe, monks and other people, uh, were who raised this in medieval times, and possibly it could even be a holdover from Roman and Greek times, because we know they bred carp, but there's just no good um, info for sure on if that was carried over or if they started over with wild carp again. But either way, this led to that mirror carp, which has chrome scales down the back and on its face and tail. I happened to catch one the other day, and it, I have another video on it and on the history and uh, a live stream where we talk about it. But that, when when uh, when it was 
domesticated more and more, and by around 1500, they'd invented a carp called the leather carp, which had no scales at all. This was not bred for being pretty or for being sparkly and able to see in ponds or fountains like the other ones had the purpose of. This was strictly for not having to descale it for food preparation because that made it more like some of the catfish and eel that was actually thought of kind of more highly um, in the world of food and society. So because of this, they became really popular with European royalty. And uh, after about a hundred years or so, flooding of royal ponds, rich people just giving them away to people who did good deeds and things like that, plus the fact that they can have like hundreds of thousands of eggs in a large female that's up to 80 pounds of the European carp or the Eurasian carp, uh, they quickly uh, spread and became not such a rare thing. And so over time, they became a really common protein source, with them becoming more and more affordable uh, within about 200 years, all the way down to working class folks. Now, within the Industrial Revolution around the 1700s and 1800s, it was a new favorite of the, the rising middle class and artisan working class, and even the people working in uh, textile factories in England and things. So... Then this story took another turn. So the fish go from ornamental, pretty fish for royalty, to common food fish. And in 1904, they go back to ornamental fish again, when in 1904, the two scaleless carp varieties, and I'm saying scaleless with the mirror carp, but it really just only has, you know, maybe 20 or 30 big scales down the spine, maybe 10 on around the face, and at most 10 around the tail. The whole body is free of scales generally, uh, although now there are versions that have scales all down the side. But in 1904, the Japanese fella thought, you know what? We should import these because we like carp. We like Asian carp and our version of carp and koi, and we eat them uh, in one strain, and then we also keep them in this beautiful strain. And so they imported them, and almost instantly koi farmers also recognize, hey, these have no scales, and they're in the same genus, we can cross them. So they cross them with the koi. And they came up with the term doitsu for this fish, which is a hybrid of the mirror carp or leather carp crossed with a Japanese carp by the name of Akiyama, which is a man uh, who existed in Japan breeding carp, and that was the family name for his strain of uh, Japanese koi, was Akiyama. So he used the mo mostly scaleless uh, carp and few metallic scales to introduce those into what we see as carp t uh, or see as koi today. So this includes the Jinrin and Doitsu morphs. And like I said, that means half of the carp that exists now could be Doitsu. So his full name, uh, the guy in 1904, uh, is Mr. Uh, Kichigoro Akeyama, and he came up with the idea to cross these fish. Uh, while the Japanese government wanted them more for a food source, he wanted them for his breeding, and so he did so. Now, the German word uh, for, for Germany is Deutschland, and to the Japanese, that sounded like doitsu, uh, or close enough. You know, that's, that's how they ended up translating, saying it. And so uh, by 1908, four years later, he successfully crossed these fish together and developed the new variety uh, that became extremely popular of koi, the shusi, shusioi. And uh, because the scaleless carp were developed and imported from Germany, uh, that name Dotsu, uh, or, or basically the Japanization of Deutschland or Deutsch, uh, Deutz, uh, is Deutsu, and it ended up sticking as a name. So we're going to leave the story here for now, but it's just the start of over a hundred more years of breeding that then continued crossing lines and making cool scales with silver scales and bright metallic scales, some fish that have no scales in some places and some just along the spine or on the head, all sorts of beautiful koi. So try Googling some of those things if you want to go back, rewatch this episode and look up some of the names I mentioned or just Google Doitsu and look at some of the combos. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll talk to you next time.
Hey guys, how's it going? Episode 116 of Fishery. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're having a good morning. I know I am because I'm recording these all at once and I'm always in a good mood when I record these because I love fish news, history, and information and telling stories. So today we're going to be talking about why you probably won't be finding any Burmese or Thai wild caught fish for a while. Uh, and that's that's a tie from the Thai border regions. You'll still get Thai fish from the western part of Thailand, the non-mountainous region. But basically, there is a full-on war that's escalating, essentially. And a lot of our fish, like the CPD, the Celestial Pearl Daniel, like the Erythromicron, the Emerald Dwarf Rasbora, the Croaking Garami, um, as well as the... Uh, thick lip garami, uh, a number of wild bettas, a number of, of the uh, baddest, um, a whole bunch of different carp and cyprinid species, uh, you know, the red tailed catfish, or the red tailed uh, loach, rather, out of Lake Inlay, um, all 58 endemic species to that basin actually are probably not going to be coming out for a long time. Now, this is a problem because. Farmers in Southeast Asia have already reported that they're having trouble with the genes and the lines uh, of those fish. You're seeing humped backs, crooked spines, and just not good health generally. And it's because they only collected these specimens, uh, they only collected so many of them. And they need to go replenish the gene pool or cross with other breeders. And the breeders are very secretive like me in the dark. <laughs> Uh-oh, my set got exposed. Anyways, so bummer uh, that they don't have the good genes and they need to go into the wild to get them. Well, getting them out of the wild is a trick because a lot of the places where they find them are near what was a tourist uh, attraction, Lake Inlay, uh, but at the same time, it's a very remote region in some ways. And when the locals and tribes and warlords kind of crack down on those areas, they make it very hard for foreigners to get around. Not to mention that the military and the, the government, which was taken over by the military, their, their semi-democratic government was taken over by the military uh, in 2001. And ever since then, some of the ethnic groups have been rebelling and saying, we want democratic rule or we want our own autonomous freedom. Now, the three major groups doing this are the Karen, the Shan, and the Wa people. And that is, again, where we get a whole bunch of, you know, gold ring danios, um, a, a lot of interesting loaches, the, the, the Burmese border loach, um, all sorts of things like that are coming out of there. And unfortunately, uh, just the other day on Facebook, uh, people in that Shan region shared uh, that a Yak-130 uh, military jet did two passes on a, on a village there and fired several salvos of unguided rockets into civilian targets. Uh, then a second video showed at least one of those same Yak-130 Russian bombing planes they're kind of old technology but it doesn't matter it's a jet fighting people on the ground with like AKs and uh, the the jet came through a village uh, at least five times firing on people on the ground with its machine guns and did 18 salvos of unguided rockets that were filmed so these attacks are said to have taken place uh, in the Mauwadi Township in the Karen State, these secondary ones, and it's where ethnic groups have uh, long been armed and wanted autonomous rule, saying they're different than the ethnic uh, mainland population of uh, Burma or Myanmar, however you know the, the country. So they've been basically training civilian militias in secret off and on for years and years. Now they've always kind of been a standby area. They've been known for um, trafficking narcotics and trafficking weapons and even people through China and Thailand, uh, as well as you know illegal endangered animals and species and uh, products and textiles and cultural exports. Uh, and adventurous tourism, which for a while was pretty safe to go to Lake Inlay. 
not so much anymore. And now it turns out that the Myanmar military government uh, has also ordered another, they want another 12 to 30 of these military aircraft, theoretically to use on their own people, as well as more rockets and missiles and bombs. So uh, basically, they seem to be uh, assisting Russia, who you know right now may not be the most popular person in the world at the uh, world poker table uh, of... of uh, people playing politics. So, I guess Myanmar is going to be pro-Russian now, and uh, all this stems from their February coup in 2021, when their army chief, General Min Aung Hlaing, Hlaing seized power from the elected government of a, from a woman named Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, and he had a coup where he literally just rolled tanks and military troops right into basically the parliament building. And right after, there were mass protests and people saying, we don't want this, we don't want this. Now, uh, to which the military responded by killing 2,000 people uh, in massacres in the street. Uh, and also they have displaced around a million people with 700 for sure, uh, for sure, uh, noted out of place right now on top of uh, the the other ethnic group that happens to be in the area uh, we won't get into right now but there's another ethnic group in the area that's been displaced of about a million people in the country too so the whole country's in in kind of turmoil right now and uh, it might be okay in some of the big cities if you're on the side of the military regime but uh, it's not okay out in the territories and the smaller uh, cities that surround the capital. Russia is a crucial supplier of weapons and equipment to Myanmar and their military, and Min Aung Hung uh, was in Moscow this month pursuing further deadly hardware. So it uh, doesn't look like the people of Myanmar will be uh, relieved from this uh, terror anytime soon. And it doesn't look like those fish, which were actually kind of kept a secret and protected for a long time in Myanmar because of their strict military government that ruled everything for so long. Uh, and before that, their kind of secretive uh, government and, and uh, forms of rule. Well, that kind of protected things after British rule from getting de super developed or, or getting destroyed. And that's why we found things like Lake... Inlay and the Shan region and the Shan Basin, which had tons of incredible fish, like hundreds of species that were discovered from 2006 to 2012, and we're still discovering more, but that's when literally a few hundred new species were announced. And unfortunately, we can't keep looking in these regions and on the Chinese border regions. Not Chinese or Western uh, scientists will be safe in those regions for the moment nor will people to source new uh, genetics for the sorely needed new uh, genetics in the big breeding and spawning operations in places like Malaysia, um, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, and on the west side of Thailand, or rather the, the east side of Thailand, sorry, the west side of Thailand is the one that's in trouble. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there are also unconfirmed reports that uh, the planes, those same Yak planes, were flying uh, within 200 yards of the Thai border and firing rockets. So not only are the ethnic groups there upset, uh, the Thai government could get pretty upset, and this could turn into an unstable situation more so. Uh, I know that is uh, only so important to fish, you know, it, it's, it's a bummer. But think of the cost to human lives, and I just like to tie human issues together with issues in our hobby and uh, how we impact one another as fish and humans. Thanks for watching. Next time on The Secret History, Living in Your Aquariums, version of Fish Tree. Back to you, Jess. All right, guys, you made it to the end of the week or the end of the episode. Either way, thanks for sticking around and listening so long. You're one of the brave few, and boy, are you a nerd. All right, episode 117, uh, 
Unfortunately, tens of thousands of endangered fish were found dead in Northern California. No, no, no. Womp, 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 womp. Yeah, not good news. So, uh, the federally endangered uh, species of fish that turned out to be the dead ones as well as other fish in the area were found in the Klamath River. It included salmonids and also lampreys. Uh, and in recent years, uh, there's been a parasite that has flourished in salmon and also like the golden trout and some of the beautiful uh, endemic species of fish in Northern California or varieties of fish. You, some of them aren't their own species, but they're their own phenotypes and color morphs that are just special to, to California, like the golden uh, trout, which is incredible. If you've never seen one, look it up. Uh, but the salmon uh, haven't been able to flourish like they usually would in these areas which have been restored or never destroyed uh, because the water's been moving slower and it's been much, much warmer. Uh, also beyond that, like I said, they've got this parasite problem and now all of a sudden hundreds and hundreds of fish start washing up day by day dead. So uh, it's a not a good thing. So after years of nego negotiation, finally four dams on the lower river that impede the migration of these salmon are on track to be removed next year. And it would be the biggest and, and most expansive dam removal and demolition project in the U.S. and one of the biggest in the world. So scientists have said that climate change has made the West warmer and dried out over the last three decades. It will continue to make weather more extreme off and on, and fi wildfires will continue to be more frequent and destructive, especially if we don't manage our forests well and tend the underbrush well. It's been long neglected in California as well as other places. So why am I talking about this? Well, it's because they think it might be linked to a forest fire that all these fish died. Um, so, I said hundreds and hundreds of fish were washing up. That was a month ago. Now there have been tens of thousands of fish washing up, including a whole lot of the endangered ones, unfortunately. So across the American West, a 22-year mega drought, as they call it, has deepened so much uh, that the region is now in its driest spell since... 1,200 years ago, and they can track this by looking at lake core samples, pollen cores, tree rings, things like that, so it's not unknown. They have a good handle on what happened all the way about 10,000 years or so, including looking at glacial ice cores as well up on the mountains uh, and, and snow-packed uh, glacial ice as well. So when this fire that they think impacted this die-off began, uh, it was given the name the McKinney Fire, and it burned just several hundred acres, and firefighter, firefighters thought they would quickly bring it under control. But all of a sudden, thunderstorms rolled in, and ferocious gusts of wind, wind uh, moved in and pushed it into an unstoppable conflagration. And this blaze was only 30% contained on Saturday, as of today. So the fish deaths being reported are a huge blow to the native people in the region, which have been working really hard to protect them and restore their old runs so that they can use them for ceremonial things like first salmon run of the year and other uh, religious and spiritual practices, but just to restore the environment and to be able to use them as a resource yet once again is extremely important. And the tribes that live in that area are the Karuk and the Yaruk tribes, which have been fighting for years to protect these fragile prop populations. And the salmon in the Klamath River, um, the salmon are revered by the Karuk and the Yaruk tribe. Uh, and California's second largest Native American tribe is the uh, Yaruk. So they do have some power and they do have some money. Um, and it's still unclear uh, if the fish kill is localized to their area where they're reporting it or if it's going to keep spreading down river. So a photo taken about um, 20 miles downstream from the Carrick uh, Reservation uh, and from where there was a flash flood in the tributary of the, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Seaad Creek 
It showed several dozens of fish bellies dead and bloated among sticks and debris that were washed up in brown and black tinted water with like ash and charcoal in it. So uh, this wildfire was burning in a remote part of California and appears to have caused tens of thousands of these fish to die according to that native tribe. And they're finding more evidence of more uh, creeks and washouts that seem to be affected either by those thunderstorms running in and causing the water levels to rise really fast or by the, the sheer fact that there was the wildfire and there's all this soot and ash and stuff in the water, which on top of being a warm uh, water condition and the fish already being in low numbers, uh, it chokes them out. You know, uh, salmonid and basically all the fish on the west coast that are freshwater all of the fish that live in rivers uh, that go up the mountains and things, they all need a lot of oxygen, and they're used to cool creeks, like under 50 degrees year-round usually. And uh, apparently we're seeing like 65 degrees, 70 degrees in some cases, and all this soot as well as trees burning down, which then the hillsides slide out, um, especially when they get the hard rains afterwards. And it's just not good. So they found the largest die-off of fish on Friday, uh, this last Friday, near Happy Camp in uh, Happy Camp Creek, California, and along the main stem of the Klamath River. It's unclear what's killing them, like I said, but biologists with the tribe believe that the flash flood caused by heavy rains over the burnt and scoured area as well as uh, retardant foam and gasoline and other debris that was just left basically on the ground from fighting the fire as well as uh, chemical retardants for the fire too uh, they think that that was washed into the water as well as the with the black carbon and soot and with maybe some mudslides so it's it's a it's a big problem the huge mckinney uh fire the largest so far of the season uh, has been burning just south of the oregon border for several days and has scorched more than 90 square miles so far this week the blaze also wiped out the scenic hamlet of klamath river which has 200 people living there usually and actually killed four people in that town unfortunately as it came through and reduced almost all the homes to burned out ash and ruins. So now the local tribe is surveying the toll on the environment and the Karuk tribe are working with the Yaruk tribe and their biologists and with the Northern California uh, Tribal Association and state and federal agencies to gain access to the fire zone to get a better sense of what's happening, maybe to put up lines or walls along the creek to help uh, prevent some of this ash maybe put oil slick uh, absorbers down see if that helps but really to get a better handle on what in the heck killed all these fish uh, for sure like which aspect of things going on did the dirty work and uh, right now there's a lot of finger pointing it's global warming it's human caused it's forest management it's dams it's this it's that and uh, the true answer is we don't know yet the science isn't in but it will be someday soon so uh stay tuned and i'll be sure to follow up on that it's a bummer to hear all right guys what's not a bummer is uh you you guys rock thanks for hanging out with me and making it to the end i know this was a long one this week pretty dense episodes but i'll see you on my channel i'll see you here again next week for fishery and thank you so very much uh if you're not subscribed i'd love it if you would and if you want to become a member a little last reminder only a buck 99 and it really helps the channel lets me do what i love and uh, continue uh, creating this content. I hope you guys have an amazing day, uh, and I'll hand it back to you, Jess, and uh, everyone, whoever's hosting the morning show today uh, with you. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Maybe I'm in the chat. Maybe I'm predicting the future right now. Uh, but I'll see you guys later, or I'll see you right now if I'm here in the chat. Uh, either way, have a great week. Bye, guys.